Everyone's in their places. Please stand. Turn to page 138. Page 138. <laughs> the Twilight Nine. Baptist Church. We don't sing loud or say amen. <laughs> God, thank you for a good night to be in your house, Lord, and the privilege we have to assemble and worship you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon the next song, Lord, and I pray to be upon the message tonight, Lord, that, Lord, if some of us may be tired, Lord, I pray we just uh, be attentive to listen, Lord, and we're just thankful to be here tonight, Lord, and thank you for everyone getting here safely. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> page, uh, what page did I turn on? Uh, I switched it. 485? Yeah. 485. <laughs> First, I wondered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. Within the sunlight of his love, and all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found. Glad I had another one. 
one picked out. Yeah. 328. 328. Dave, good job. I was prepared. We're ready. On accident. (laughs) 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 On the first. Good to be in church, amen. Good to be in church on a Wednesday night, as always. All right. Yeah, I kind of remembered a little bit earlier this time. There we go. Getting used to the whole thing. All right. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Street preaching this Saturday, guys. Uh, Pastor Paul will be your group team leader. Oh, boy, you're going to have a great time. Amen? You're going to have a great time. Don't forget your signs. I brought my signs back, so they are here. Uh, You'll have a good selection to choose from, so you might want to. I took all the good ones. Not that, not that, you know, there's any scriptures that aren't good, but I took the ones that were um, really good and focused on on the gospel. So I brought them back, and uh, it's open game there for whoever wants to grab one after service. What's that? I wasn't convicted one bit. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, But I just didn't want them in my truck anymore. I was getting too full. Um, Let's see. We've we've got a wedding coming up here soon, don't we? All right. Don't forget to wear your masks. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to preach that one again. (laughs) Uh, And then uh, make sure that's uh, Fiddledy Farms, 530 August 14th. All right. Hope everybody remembers that. August 14th. Uh, Revival's coming up. We'll touch on that closer to. Um, Don't forget, well, we can mention that Sunday. So I don't think I have any other real announcements that I want to cover tonight. We're just going to go ahead and get into the message this evening. Ephesians chapter 3 tonight. Ephesians chapter 3. Well, you and I got it real good, don't we? 
We really do. Um, you know, when I was, uh, you don't you don't actually need as much stuff as you think you do in order to be happy. You know that? Amen. You really don't need hardly anything to be happy, because happiness is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, with food and raiment, there with such or with food and raiment, there with be content. Um, <laughs> I was when we had our family staycation last week. We took the kids to. Uh, Moss Wright Park and did that whole fort tour thing and it was it was really neat you know and I of course liked asking all the questions on what materials they used to build and how they built it and how long would that roof last and you know all those kinds of guy questions you know but they they brought us into this um, shed I mean it was it was a shed and it it was it had to have been I don't know maybe no bigger than uh, maybe from the end of the altar to about here. Wouldn't you say, babe, maybe a little smaller than that? Okay, fine. We'll say about right here. About, about that much. And uh, had a little loft right up there. Had a little fireplace. And I said, that's for a family of five or six. And I was like, boy, doesn't that put things in perspective? Uh, and they lived happily like that. But today, families of five or six need to have 4,000 square feet. You want to know why? Because everybody's trying to get away from each other. Nobody knows how to live together anymore. I'm serious. You think about it. No, parents don't know how to deal with their kids, so they say, kids, go to your room. The kids don't want to be around the parents, so they go to their room. And then the kids don't want to be around each other, so everybody's in their own separate room. Did, how many of you grew up and you, as a child, did not have your own separate bedroom? Okay, now look at that. I didn't have it growing up as a kid. Now, how many of you had it since day one? You've had your own bedroom. The silver spoon children is what it is. <laughs> Those are the ones that I need to keep an eye on. Of course, you're the only kid. That's true. I didn't think about that. How many of you were not an only child and you had your own bedroom? Okay, that was, you know, there's still a good amount. But that just... Uh, you know, it just kind of sets you back a little bit to consider, you know, we have so much stuff. And families back then lived off of, they died because they, uh, this, this, this guy's wife and daughter, I think is what it was, they both died because they ate butter that was, went bad. Butter went bad, so they died. And it was just like, man, we have so much to be thankful for. We don't deal with that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't have to... They had to build forts and walls around their houses to keep Indians out. I mean, you don't have to deal with that nonsense. Um, Redskins, we can't say that word. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be socially unacceptable. Um, yeah, there you go. Native Americans, African Americans, Italian Americans. We can't call them uh, anything else but that. We, heaven forbid we offend somebody. All right. Ephesians chapter 3 tonight. Verse 16. Well, yeah. Well, start in 14 because this is kind of catching in the middle of Paul's prayer. We want to get the context of what he's asking for here. Verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, ye uh, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth, all knowledge, or which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Let's ask the Lord's blessing tonight. Father, it is good to be saved. Uh, Lord... Uh, if you didn't do anything else for us besides that, uh, Lord, you've been more than good to us. And we thank you for salvation. We thank you for the eternal security that accompanies it. Uh, God, we pray that we, as we assemble tonight, Father, to get something out of the book, that, uh, Lord, you, you just use me, Father, the best way that you see fit. Lord, I don't have much to offer here at all tonight except myself and, and this vessel, Lord, to just be... Um, 
moved and directed, Lord, to speak the words that you'd have tonight. And God, I pray you'd get into the message, Lord, get into the outline, or else it's just a complete waste of time if you don't show up and meet with us, Lord. So we uh, ask that you'd have your hand upon the service and that Jesus Christ would be glorified in everything that's said and done. And Lord, and everybody that's receiving the word as well, that it would be pleasing in your sight. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 3, we, we're going to take a look at verse 16. Remember last week we looked at verse 15, dealing with the whole family in heaven and earth. And the whole family was not just in reference to the bride, it was in reference to the entire family, all the way from those that were uh, prior to the law at the beginning of time, and it's including all of those that will be at the end of the millennium. Every single individual that gets to heaven, they're part of the whole family. Yet out of that entire family, there's one bride, and that's who we are. And uh, we have a marriage supper there at Revelation 19. After we, get, uh, after we go through the judgment seat of Christ and we're now presentable, uh, and we've been, uh, if you will, clean through the judgment, uh, and then we've got guests that attend that wedding ceremony with us, and those guests are all part of the family. Uh, so verse 16, this is a continuation of his prayer. He says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So here we see some things regarding strength. Paul's asking for strength. He knew that, uh, and, and by the way, you and I need the strength of the Lord to live the life that we live. I mean, this is just, uh, people, are, people disappoint you, uh, churches disappoint you, um, sometimes God disappoints you. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but sometimes he does because your expectations are different than what his are. You, God can disappoint you. <laughs> Uh, the key to not being disappointed by God is to always make sure your expectations line up with His. Amen. But that's not always the case. And sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes you're going to feel all alone. David felt all alone, and he encouraged himself in the Lord. Yeah. So that strength of the Lord is necessary. And if anybody knew that, Paul did. Uh, he had entire continents turn against him. Uh, the man knew what it meant, notwithstanding it, the Lord stood with me. He knew what that meant. Look over at Psalm chapter 138. So we see here first uh, the source of our strength. The source of our strength is in the Lord. Uh, and I know that's a, a, a real deep thought, you know. But, you know, the best things to deliver you in your walk with the Lord are not the deep things. They're the simple things. You know that? You understanding some Bible doctrine that some guy poured himself into for two years is not the key to your ministry being successful. It's not the key to you being able to live a fulfilling walk with Jesus Christ. It's the simple stuff. And that's the stuff we always overlook. It's the stuff we always take for granted. Oh, the Lord's our strength. Yeah. Well, wait, wait, wait. The Lord is your strength. So when we start looking at that thing, let's take a look at some verses here about that. Psalm chapter 138, verse 3. In the day when I cried, thou answerest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. So that shows you that those that tap into that prayer life with the Lord are the ones that have strength. You don't pray, you don't, you're not strong if you don't pray. Uh, when you look at um, prayer, I mean, is actually uh, what keeps you from praying is pride. It's what it is. If you don't pray, it's because you're a proud Christian. And the reason why it's, it, it's rooted in pride, uh, the lack of prayer is rooted in pride, is because prayer uh, stresses a point of dependency on someone. And so when you pray, it's a reminder in that you are, you are acknowledging, I'm dependent on somebody else's strength in this thing. And when you don't pray, it's I can handle this. I'm fine. I don't need help. Um, if there's anything that I've tried to stress to my kids when they're young, my kids can sometimes get frustrated at things. You ever had your kids get frustrated? Uh, you know, they'll be trying to fix something or they'll be, some toy broke and they're trying to do this or they're trying to put something together just so and they get frustrated and you know the kid starts to, oh, you know, they get frustrated with themselves. And I remind them, because I'm conscious of this, that if they don't do this with me, they won't do this with him. And I say, can I help you? I say, 
can you ask daddy for help? And so now it's starting to become natural for my children when they've got a situation they can't solve, they say, daddy, can you come help me? What am I trying to train them? I'm trying to train them to have a dependency on dad. It's not that you're trying to keep your kids from being able to stand on their own two feet, but they need to understand there are some things that are beyond their ability to solve, and you need to acknowledge that as quick as you can and carry it to the Father. That's, those are the ones that are able to get strength early on. It's not sitting there getting frustrated with the situation because you can't fix it. The true person who has strength is not the person who has all the answers. The true person with strength is the person who knows how to rely on the one who does have all the answers. There is not a person in this room tonight who has all the answers. I don't have all the answers. He doesn't have all the answers. I know you probably love your dad's kids and you love your mom's, but they don't have all the answers. And you especially don't have all the answers if you're below the age of 20. You don't even have a third of the answers. Maybe not even a fifth. I mean, you're just now starting to scratch the surface of what it means to be a man paying a cell phone bill. You know what I'm saying? There's a whole lot more to manhood later on in life that you start to learn. But my point is this. The ones that experience strength are the ones that don't necessarily have all the answers to fix all the problems. It's the ones that relied the fastest upon Jesus Christ. Those are the ones that have strength. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Uh, so that source of strength is the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't expect God, before which time he puts you through a test, to give you all of the strength necessary in and of yourself to go through it. What God oftentimes wants to do is put you in positions that says, no, I'm not going to give you all the strength to do it on your own. I'm going to give you the, the, the ability to rely on my strength through the entire process. It's kind of like Peter getting out of the boat. He was able to do what he needed to do walking on the water as long as he trusted and relied upon Jesus Christ the entire way. Then he had the strength. But the moment he took his eyes off, there was no strength within him. There was no ability within him. So don't think when, you, when you're going to, to God in prayer or, or whatever about certain things and you say, Lord, uh, I pray that you'd strengthen me for this thing and give me the strength that I need. Sometimes he says, my strength is made perfect in weakness, meaning I'm going to put you in a position where you cannot do it on your own and you have to rely on my strength. Amen. And that's not a comfortable position to be in. That is a very vulnerable place to be in. And gentlemen, do you know one thing that we hate being? We hate being vulnerable. Amen. Men don't like being put in a position where they could fall flat on their face and look like an idiot in front of their wife and kids. Or, you know, that's why guys don't like to cry. Guys don't like crying in public. You know what guys like crying in public? Well, I mean, I've met some, but they're just males. They're not really men. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, uh, no offense, guys, no offense. Uh, I, I mean, I can cry in front of other people and stuff, but naturally, a man does, he tries to choke back his tears, right? Or have you ever watched a, a movie with your wife and it kind of got you? And it's not supposed to. And you're sitting there like, you know. <laughs> You know, or kind of put your head behind the pillow so you can <laughs> wipe it real quick and come back forward again. And then she looks at you and she's bawling. And you're like, what are you crying about? <laughs> you know what I mean? That kind of, you just kind of maneuvered yourself real quick there, you know. Guys don't like to cry because that shows vulnerability. Men don't like to be put in a situation that's vulnerable. Women don't like to be put in a situation that's vulnerable. They don't like, uh, they want to be able to trust their husband. They want to be able to feel security in their husband. And there's times when both parties are not going to be able to uh, necessarily always have all of those answers. And you're going to have to rely solely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not fun, but boy, looking back on it, you'll appreciate what you've learned through it. Look at Psalm chapter 28. If anybody knew how to rely on the Lord, I think about key men, all of the men of God. But man, guys like David, uh, you got people hunting after you. You know what I mean? Uh, that's a different kind of a thing. 
Paul obviously had people chasing him down, trying to see him get put to death. Uh, just, just a bunch of adversity, yet our areas of vulnerability are, you know, can't, can't pay a bill or, you know, it's just things that, that I would say as men, we, uh, we have really, um, I guess, limited ourselves in really what we trust God in. Money should not be the only thing you trust God in. Um, man, you should be going further than that in your walk with God, where you're having to rely upon him in areas of your emotions, of your heart, in areas of, of decision and ministry and things that uh, are of more value than just money. Psalm chapter 28, I told you, right? Uh, chapter 28, look at verse 8. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Look at verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. He says that thing three times in that, uh, in that uh, verses 7 and 8. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is their strength. He is the saving strength. You get the point? He's the strength. Amen. Uh, look over at Isaiah chapter 40. Here's a real well-known one, this thing on the strength. He is our source of strength, or he is supposed to be. Isaiah chapter 40. And think about all the things you worry about. I mean, seriously, just take a minute to kind of reflect. Just over the last 24 hours, what things have you worried about? I'm serious. You think about it for a second. Money? I can tell you things, not, not, maybe not worry, but things that have uh, consumed my thoughts. Money, uh, home repairs, um, you know, job stuff, uh, you know, anything there. Property, you know, just all kinds of things that you're, you're just ministry. That's another one. Uh, and that's just over the last 24 hours, folks. I mean, take an entire week of how much stuff you just kind of dwell on. And <laughs> uh, how much lighter would life be if you just relied upon the Lord? I went through the, my house, and Brother Titus knows I'm dealing with some uh, fun water issues. Water's never fun to deal with in a house. Water's like the most, that's, I think water's the number one enemy to a house. I really do. But anyway, I'm, I got some water issues at my house and stuff, and so I'm just sitting there like, Lord, how am I going to work this out? I got I to gotta make this change. I got to move this over here. I got to I gotta make all these changes. I don't know how to do it. I'm literally just walking through the house, and I said, Lord, I'm done with this. I'm done worrying about it. I'm just going to give it to you. You figure it out however you want to do it, Lord. I'm fine with whatever you want to do. I'm thankful I got a roof over my head. I'm thankful that I have a nice home. I'm thankful my kids are not even aware of what's going on. My kids are just living life to the fullest, and that's how I should be when I'm under Daddy's roof, you know? Uh, but the Lord takes care of that stuff. We just don't have to worry as much as we really do if we would rely upon him faster. Look at second. Did I, I didn't read 40, Isaiah 40. Let me read Isaiah 40. That's a good verse. Y'all know where I'm going to. It's verse 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. You see that? He gives it to you as you need it. God does not just strengthen you for the sake of strengthening you. What's the point of strengthening you if the strength isn't going to be put to use? That's kind of like Romans chapter 12, the proportion of faith that God gives. Well, what, what you are asked to do and what you follow through with God to do and commit to God, I'm going to do this, God says, okay, I'm going to give you some faith for that. It's the same thing with strength. If you're not going to step out in any area of your walk with Christ that's going to be uncomfortable or going to require some trust, why does God need to add strength to you? He doesn't need to. Uh, not unless those tools are going to be put to use. So uh, you know what you'll find? You'll find that when you step out on a street corner and you say, I'm going to do this for the Lord, and boy, I sure am scared to death. Amen. 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 Uh, you know what God does? Gives it to you, man. Gives you the strength. Gives you the strength. Uh, you know, when you sit there and you say, I don't, I, I don't think I can pass this track out because, boy, I just don't feel comfortable. And then you say, but I'm going to do it. You know what the Lord says? I'll give you strength. 
God matches the task with strength. Uh, but he doesn't just throw, throw away resources in areas that they're not going to be put to use. God's going to put his resources where they will be put to use. All right. Now, um, keep reading with me. Verse 30. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. Let me tell you something, young people. You need God's strength. You don't... I know as young people, and I would classify myself in that group, the older I can get in, the, I don't know, I'm only 29, but I feel like I'm getting really old. I don't know why. I've been looking at myself, and I'm like, man, the hair's grayer, and things are just starting to change more. Not supposed to be this way at 29. I don't know. But... Um, you know what you find? that Young people sometimes think they, their youth and their strength, they just got it all. Step aside, you older folks. I got this. <laughs> and you know what all the older people are doing? <laughs> Give them two years. Let's see what happens. I'm not saying you're trying to sit back and, and make fun of folks, but kind of. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the youths need it. Youths are going to faint too. Everybody gets to a place where they're like, I can't go no more. And that's when the Lord's strength has to kick in. Keep reading. He says, the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord. See, that first person that, that bends the knee to the Father when they're needing strength, the first person that realizes, I can't do this, is the person here, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, they shall, and they shall walk and not faint. So you ever gotten to a spot in work where you've just been working for like a year straight? You didn't take any breaks, no PTO, nothing. I mean, you've just been killing it, right? And then you get down there to the point where work, you've just lost all pleasure and enjoyment in work. You find no fulfillment in what you do. You are exhausted. You're frustrated with all the people you work around because you're just done. You come home and you're aggravated at your wife and your wife's now aggravated at you. So now all of a sudden, and then you start to see it just taking its toll physically. Do you know what? I've, and I've gotten to that place before. I've gotten to that place where I was literally at just so much frustration. This was at my last job. My boss told me, and uh, he was a good boss, but he told me, he said, uh, he said, I can see it on your face right now. You need to take a break. You need to step away. So I expect by the end of this day, you send in a PTO request. I want you to take some time off. I said, okay, I'll do it. But you know what that was? I didn't see it in myself that I needed to rely on some, that I was out of strength as soon as I was. Like I, I didn't see that in myself. Because sometimes we always think we can always do a little bit more. We're fine. We can always push a little harder. And we almost think that when we have to rely on someone else's strength, that we're bad for doing so. Or that you're less than if you have to ask for someone else's help. But that is the sign of strength in a Christian, in your walk with God, is to recognize, I can't do this. And the sooner that you can recognize that, the sooner you can tap into that source of strength. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4. I mean, have you parents ever gotten frustrated with your kids and you're like, I don't know what else to do? Okay, that's your, that's your, your breaking point. You're done. You've gone as far as you can go. I don't know what else to do. And I, by the way, I don't like it when... Uh, yeah, I guess I could say that. I don't really like it when I hear people say, all you can do is pray. You know, well, I guess all I can do is pray. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Prayer is not a, I guess all I can do. Like, there's nothing else better to do. Prayer is what you should have done at the beginning. Amen. The sooner you do that, the more strength you can equip. But sometimes we kind of feel like we have to burn ourselves out first. And then when, you know, well, I guess we got to pray. What kind of a Christianity is that? You're supposed to go to him immediately with your needs and your cares. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, I quoted this verse earlier. He says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. So that means if you're going to get God's strength, you better make sure he's on your side. 
notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Can God stand with you on what you're doing? Sometimes we get ourselves into situations, and the reason why we're out of strength is because God says, I ain't over there. I ain't over there. And you know what? He, and you know what? When we get to prayer, we start praying to the Father. We say, God, help me. And he says, I'll help you get back over here, but I ain't coming over there. He's not pleased with wickedness. He's not pleased with that stuff. So you know what he says? Yeah, I'll meet you halfway. I'll help you get draw nigh back unto the Father, but draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto thee. I get that. But sometimes the reason why we run out of strength is because you're not even uh, you're not even in the Father's reach, so to speak, to get that strength. You've stepped away so far from what God's doing and where he's at and what he wants you to do that, yeah, you run out of strength. It's just like Peter on the water. I can't use that analogy enough. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that Jesus Christ was gone. He was still there. But because he had gotten consumed with worry and he gotten consumed with the waves and the clouds and the storms, he said, Lord, help me, and he reached out and he grabbed him. But, folks, what I'm trying to say is, is that if you want God's strength, you better make sure he can stand with you in what you're doing. That means I'm not going to endeavor in anything until I know that it's God's will for me to do it. If I can support it with a book, I'll do it, and then I can trust that God will stand with me because I'm doing what he says to do. Uh, all right, keep reading. He says, and strengthen me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So that source of strength, that's the Lord Jesus Christ and you better recognize it soon. And that was something that Paul knew it was so important in his Christian life. He said, I'm going to pray for you specifically that you'd be strengthened by his, uh, with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now you see the permit for our strength. So you saw the source but what permits you to get that strength? Well, he says that there in the verse. That he would grant you, comma, according to the riches of his glory, comma, to be strengthened with might by his spirit. So what gives me that permission to receive his strength is the riches of his glory. And the riches of his glory is in reference to the grace that came through salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Go back over there, Ephesians chapter 1. You understand what I'm saying? The, the, the reason why you have permission to be strengthened. Why am I permitted to get God's strength? Well, it's because the grace of God has already saved you and he dwells within you. So he says there in Ephesians 1 verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Just as he said there in, in Ephesians 3.16, I'm asking him to strengthen you according to the riches of his glory, according to the grace of God, according to the riches of his grace that was given to us on salvation. I'm asking by that salvation that God would strengthen you, by that grace, because grace is what saved your soul. He says the same thing in Ephesians 1.18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You have an inheritance in the saints. The riches of the glory of the inheritance of his saints is an undefiled, incorruptible uh, inheritance reserved in heaven for you. That's something that is available to all saints because all saints are children of God. There's one inheritance that's offered unto all saints, and that's a home in heaven. There's another inheritance that's offered unto all saints that's dependent upon your obedience to Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 covers that. So you've got two different inheritances there, and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This is for all saints. And the riches of the glory is dealing with their salvation. So Paul says, according to the fact that you're saved... You have permitted, you're permitted to receive God's strength because his grace has saved you. That's what he says, and I'm asking according to that grace. Uh, he says the same thing, I'll read it for you, uh, in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 27. He says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among Gentiles, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
So he says, according to that, according to your salvation, according to the grace that saved you and put Jesus Christ in you and you in him, I'm asking that he would strengthen you according to that. So grace leads to more strength. The grace of God doesn't just save you, but it also continues to strengthen you. That, uh, um, look over, I think it's 2 Corinthians, yeah, 2 Corinthians 12. Look at 2 Corinthians 12. We quoted this one earlier as well. And this kind of sums the thing up. That grace is what gives you strength. All right, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So the grace gives the entrance to strength. Grace gives the entrance to strength. Uh, he also says over in Hebrews chapter 4, and in verse 16, he says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. Well, how do you get help? You get help through strength. Okay, if you can't help yourself, you're relying on someone else's strength to help. And the help and the strength comes through the throne of grace to find grace. So one, the throne of grace, why do you have access to the throne of grace? Well, you're a child of God, right? right. All right, but then the throne of grace gives you more grace. Because that grace is what's given. The additional grace is what's given to help in time of need. So that's the, that's the permit for our strength is because we're children of God. Grace finds answered prayers. That's what it does. The more grace you've got. We also see the communication of our strength. His prayer, Paul's prayer, was for these folks to be filled and strengthened with the Spirit of God. Uh, if you look over in Romans chapter 7 with me, Romans chapter 7, this thing on strength. The Lord is our strength. So he wanted to be uh, filled with that Spirit of God that was inside of him. Because uh, the Spirit of God, folks, he desires after something. He's delighted in something. And in verse 22 it says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So that spirit of God within you desires that book and desires that strength. This is how the strength of God is given to us as Christians. It comes through this book. This book strengthens you. And yes, the spirit of God and his grace strengthens you. But one of the avenues by which you're strengthened through the spirit of God is through this book. Because this is what the Spirit of God delights after. So if the more, the more that you're filled with the Spirit of God, the more you're going to get in this book. Because this is what he desires. This is what he likes. This is his Fruit Loops and his Cap'n Crunch. All right? He likes this stuff. And so the more that you're in that thing, the more strengthened you're becoming. That's how your strength is communicated. It's communicated through that book. Uh, it's communicated not by... Uh, a walk or wisdom that's obtained by your ability. Look over at Zechariah. There's a good one for you. Can you get there? It's the book right before the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah. Zechariah Malachi. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 4. I always thought it was funny hearing some preachers pronounce some of these things. I was like, I never thought to pronounce it that way. Like, I never would have, Hab Habakkuk. I've heard people, Habakkuk. Habakkuk. And I'm like, <laughs> how did you even come up, Habakkuk? Or Philistines. I'm like, Philistines is what I've always called it. But I don't know, maybe, maybe you're supposed to call it Philistines. I don't know. But Malachi is another one. Uh, where are we at? Zechariah chapter 4, look at verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by my might, or I'm sorry, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So it's not by your ability that you receive the strength. That strength is communicated from something eternal. 
that strength is communicated through something that's everlasting. Uh, if you look in, um, I'll read it for you for sake of time, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 18, it says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. The, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. So when a man starts to think that he has the ability within himself to have the strength that he needs, the Bible says you can deceive yourself. Did you ever know that? You can trick yourself. That's interesting. Everybody always thinks they're going to get tricked by someone else. Everybody's on guard about being deceived by some church member who's wayward, some guy at work, or someone else who's going to pull them away. What about you? <laughs> you can deceive your own self, and the way that you can, one of the ways that you can do that is to think that you're something that you're not. Pride is something that will deceive you into thinking something about yourself that's just not true. And one of those things is the fact that I can handle it. I'm fine. No, this strength doesn't come through man's wisdom or man's might. This thing comes through the wisdom of God and through his spirit. Uh, so that means that you've got to play by the Lord's rules. If you want to be able to have a successful Christian life, one that's strengthened, one that's operating at his capacity, you need to play by his rules. He says in Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 10 and 11, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That thing about the armor of God, um, you remember over there, uh, David, when he's fighting Goliath, and, and they, they put Saul's armor on him. He says, I can't go into battle with these. I haven't proved them. Right. right? I haven't proved this armor. Then why is it, though, that God tells you to take on his armor? Because it's been proven. That armor's been proven. That armor whipped the adversary You're at right. Calvary. Right. Proven. So now he says, hey, put my armor on. <laughs> you see, Saul tried to position it to use his, his, his armor and his knowledge and his wisdom of what warfare was. My, my only question was always, Saul, you're over like seven feet tall. Why weren't you the one out there facing Goliath? You know what I mean? Why? Because all he had was man's wisdom and man's power and man's strength, and it wasn't enough to fight what God had before him. You might look all strong and big and buff and powerful, Yet when you put the armor on, you're nothing still because you're not proven in the armor of God. You've got to do this thing in God's armor. So it has nothing to do with your ability, which is reassuring. <laughs> because I don't have much ability. I don't, and you don't either. What ability do you have? I mean, think about what you were like when you came out of the womb. Pooping and peeing all over yourself, sitting in it. I mean, just crying and screaming and, and scratching and just making a mess of things. And then you grow up and you don't change. You just do it on a much larger scale. <laughs> just bigger pee and bigger poop and bigger problems and bigger screaming. But you know what? We have zero ability in and of ourselves. We really don't have much ability at all. We are but dust, and he knoweth our frame. That's what the Bible says. So I, I like the fact that God doesn't rely on my ability to do something because, to be honest, if you were to even compare across this room people's abilities in the ministry, they would all vary. There's some people that have been at this thing a long time. There's some people that are just starting out. There's some people that are maybe on their way out. And you know what I think of? I like the fact that it's the type of armor that I can put on and say, no matter where you're at, you can make it right. 
you can do the right thing because it's not based upon your ability. Lastly, about this thing on strength, go back over there to Ephesians 3. Last thing on strength that we want to look at. Isn't that incredible that you can get so much out of one verse? That is just incredible. There is no way this book was written by man. There's not outside of the man of Jesus Christ, amen, the man of the Holy Spirit. There is no way it was written by man. Man cannot produce a book like this that you can spend so much time on just a, a sentence. It's not even an entire sentence. It's got a semicolon in there. It's part of a sentence. You think about that. You get so much for your life out of a part of a sentence. I've never met a man that I've ever talked with that I said, I could take just the first thing he said to me and I could meditate on that for the rest of my week. There's no way I could do that. I've never met anybody that intelligent. But I can come to this book and I can read a part of a sentence and say, man, that's convicting, and just dwell on it for a whole week. We got a great book. He gave us, this is, and I heard a preacher, an old preacher once say, and it's the best description, this book is the kiss of God on our soul. That's exactly what it is. Uh, you see the placement of our strength. Look at what uh, Paul says there in verse 16. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So the placement of that strength, Paul's prayer was directed toward the inside of those Christians. It wasn't a prayer of conformity on the outside. It was a prayer of conformity on the inside. And we get wrapped up on praying on the outside. Paul was saying, I'm praying for the inside because the inside will change the outside. So the best way to pray for someone is to allow the outside to show you how to pray for the inside. But don't just pray for the outside. God, help them to stop doing this. Help them to stop doing this. Uh, Lord, uh, change their skirt length or change their, their you know, attire, change their music. Listen, you pray towards the inside, and all that stuff and a whole lot more will change. Amen. Paul said, I'm praying for the inner man. Again, as we've seen uh, in Bible study over the past few weeks, it's about God's character getting inside of us and less of our character being there. Uh, look with me just a few more verses here in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. So the placement of the strength, God's going to place the strength not in muscle, not in your brain. He's going to place it in the inner man. So if you want strength, you've got to allow the inner man to be full or else you're not going to have the strength that you need. He's the one that's going to give you that strength. He must increase and I must decrease. So it's not that God is going to use his strength to embellish you as a human. His strength is there to embellish the inside, and the inside is what takes over. That's the reason why when, when you saw Daniel and um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't necessarily guys. That's why you saw David. David was what? Physically. He was ready, short, young, and really, in the grand scheme of things, didn't know much. What about Josiah? What do you think of him? You know, <laughs> Josiah. I mean, seriously, think about Josiah, eight-year-old kid. What did he know? Not much, but he had something on the inside that was strengthening. So the, the strength is about the inside. It's not about us trying to receive more attention on the outside. Matter of fact, it's covered on the inside, so hardly any of you is going to be recognized. It's going to be the Holy Spirit that's doing the work. Jeremiah chapter 33, I told you, right? 30, 31. I'm sorry, 31. Jeremiah 31. Let's hope it's the right verse. I've, I've had a track record before. I'm trying to do better. Verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their, where? Inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. You can cross-reference that to 2 Corinthians 6, 
where he says, uh, after he's separating, he says, I'm going to be their God and they shall be my people. The whole idea is that God's trying to address the inside. So be careful how you're trying to mentor and disciple people in the ministry, especially those that are young in the faith. Some of those that are older in the ministry, they know better, and you can address those things. But you got to remember that some people just starting out. They, they got to work on the inside. So don't get them distracted on the outside. Don't get them consumed with the outside. Get them focused on the inside. If anything, they should be consumed with their walk with Jesus Christ. That should be the thing that they're focused on the most. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. We're almost done. 1 Peter chapter 3. I know it's been a long day, hasn't it? has for me. But it'd been a whole much worse day if I'd stayed home from church. Because <laughs> I'm pastor. <laughs> <laughs> would have been just as bad for you though right because you need church first peter chapter three look at verse four. Oh, I, I always do this let's look at verse three i like three who's adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, the inside, which is in the sight of God of great price. You see, a lot of times we're trying to focus on the outward conformity. Why? Because we're trying to, uh, we're trying to be seen of men of great price. We're trying to be recognized by other people as great Christians. But the focus needs to be, what does God see of great price? Because the Pharisees had the outside down to a T. The Lord called them whited sepulchers. But inside, they had all kinds of death inside of them. So you can, you can get people to, to be conformed on the outside. Independent Baptist churches used to be, this was probably back in the 70s, maybe 60s, maybe before, I don't know. I don't know the exact, like, decade but when independent Baptist churches were really at their peak, I mean, there were churches that used to have barber chairs in the main auditor or the main uh, foyer when you walk into the church. And if you had hair as a, as a guy that was touching your ear or touching the back of your collar, you sat down in that barber chair first, and then you made sure that you gave them a haircut before they went into church. And the whole thing was based off of 1 Corinthians 11 and, you know, all the, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. What the point was, and then even it came to like glasses, and there were certain kinds of wire-rimmed glasses you were supposed to wear. This nonsense that was all about outward conformity, Amen. rules and structure, and I'm all for rules and structure. But the point is, is that you have to put less rules and structure in when the inside's doing what it should do. Amen. The rules and structure, yes, there's a time and a place for those, and they're needed at times, but the goal is... Rather than trying to do all of the thinking for the Holy Spirit, is to let Him do the job and allow Him to work. Does it take longer to get results? Sure it does. Do you think it's harder to get results? Sure it is. It's harder from the standpoint as a teacher. Do you think it's easier for me to say, Titus, you're getting a haircut, you can't come to church until you get a haircut. Boom, result. But maybe it might take a month or two months or three months of sitting under preaching before which time God touches him about something. But the benefit to him getting it through preaching is that God touched him about it. I didn't. And so the, the focus of, the, of focusing on the inner man is so that the change can be permanent, not generational, not bound to a certain movement. You know how many movements we've gone through? Uh, how many m religious movements, whether it's promise keepers or you study any cult, it's like they had their time and then they're gone. But we're talking about creating something here that goes from one generation to the next generation, from one generation to the next generation, from, well, your dad, I mean, your dad and mom aren't here, but from that generation to that generation, from that generation to my wife, who's maybe in the nursery. You know what I'm saying? It's going from one generation to the next. 
And then it should go from that generation to the next. It shouldn't be something that fizzles out because it's, it's a permanent thing on the inside. Amen. So it's got to be the hidden man of the heart. It's got to be a focus of what brings great price to God. Do you know what brings... I'm going to say something that would probably go against the grain of so many independent Baptist churches today, but it's the truth. That I believe that a church that's filled with girls that are wearing clothing that probably wouldn't be permissible, but they're in church listening to preaching, trying to grow, brings a whole lot more glory to God than some church where everybody's wearing something down to their ankles and something down to their wrists and all the way up to their neck, and they're not paying attention to anything. You know what? I, I, I'm not talking about trying to bring the world into the church. I'm talking about letting the truths remain as it is. The standard remains as it is. The preaching remains as it is. But let them come as they may to hear the truth of the Word of God. Amen. So, yeah, I think that I could have a guy sitting over there covered in tattoos and piercings and his hair's probably uh, lime green at the top and, and he's wearing his skull t-shirts and all that stuff and the next person sitting over here is coming in with those big baggy jeans and he's probably walking and trying to hold them up as he's going. I believe that a church like that can bring more glory to Jesus Christ because the people are trying to build the inner man. Amen. Bring them all in. I don't care. You know, why do you think we went and invited the entire biker club for Brother Spurgeon? There, that means, folks, I'm just trying to put some things in different perspective here. That means you could have people in church that don't know a thing about God. They're just starting out, and they might let a cuss word slip in church. And you know what you might do? Pastor. <laughs> pastor, I don't think this person's good to have around the children. Young ears, Pastor. Innocent. Yeah. I wonder if your heart's just as innocent as their mouth. Do you know what the problem is? I think a church that has those kinds of things taking place can bring more glory to God than some stoic bunch of stuffed shirts in church. Did I? I think I covered that. Let me show you the last verse. (laughs) Romans chapter 2. Let me show you the last verse tonight. Look, folks, I'm I'm not trying to downplay standards, and I'm not trying to downplay... Uh, sanctification. I'm just saying give people time to work on it. That's all I'm saying. The end goal is the same, but let's give them time to work on it and let's focus our attention in the right place, which is the inner man. Romans chapter 2, verse 29. The Bible says, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men. Look at that. That's what we just talked about. But of God. It's not about man's praise. And I could have some IFB preacher come in here and all of you could be dressed to the T and and function perfectly within your little IFB model and, you know, think like an IFB and all this stuff. And you could, you know, just be so perfect. And they say, man, you got a great church, brother. you got a great church. But you know what? We've had more preachers come in this church where guys are coming in off of work, greasy, stained, and they're in their work clothes, and they're like, I'm here. And they're sitting down, and then they, you know, you got some folks that are uh, maybe, who knows, their hair's crazy colors or whatever, and they're sitting there, and then the preacher afterward comes up and says, man, there is a liberty to preach here like I've not experienced in many places. And I'm telling you, that's been the testimony for the past probably two or three preachers that have preached meetings here in this church, you know what they say? There is a liberty to preach there, brother. There is an incredible amount of liberty to preach there. And you know what that is? That's the Spirit. It's where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's liberty. There's liberty to fix things and work on things when the Spirit of God is doing what He's supposed to do. So the strength, the source of the strength is the Lord Jesus Christ. The permit for our strength, it's the glory, it's the grace of God that gives us the ability to get that strength. The communication of our strength, the prayer was focused on getting strength in the inner man, the spirit of God, and the placement of that strength was that we knew it was going to be an inward placement. That's where the strength was going to be built up. 
It wasn't an outward thing. It wasn't man's wisdom. It was inside. And the more that we can be conscious and aware, we'll look at that next week in verse 17, the more we can be aware of the presence of God in us, the better off we're going to be. Amen? Let's all stand and we'll close out in a word of prayer tonight.